Hi everyone, it's Judy. Welcome back to the On Track Podcast. Today I'm joined with my dear friend and colleague, Ben Jordan, and we do really what's like a year-end wrap. We talk about routing engines, we talk about RF, microwave, and high-speed design and how they differ. We talk about signal integrity, and also we talk about what design holds for 2020 and beyond. I think you're going to enjoy it. Lastly, we share some resources and links that we hope will be our holiday gift to you. So lean and enjoy. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome to All Teams On Track podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Well, Ben, welcome back. It's been a long time since we've been in the yellow chairs. I've missed having you and I'm excited to do a podcast with you today. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Judy. It's it's always fun doing this. Yes, it's fun for me as well. It has been a while. (laughs) So um, today I thought we would just jump around, sort of cover you know, what's going on here, what's going on in the, in the PCB community at large and just sort of do like a news update, right? Yeah, what's sure. going on. So, um, starting out with Ultimate Designer 20, we, we released that, um, very recently and it seems to be getting good response. And one of the, the hottest, uh, most well-received features really seems to be, um, the the routing feature and specifically the any angle routing yeah Mm -hmm. and as we've just chatted here around the office you had told me something interesting is that um something about why we've always as cad tool manufacturers across the board seem to stick with 45 and 90 degree angles why like why hasn't anybody gone to this any angle before and you have some background on yeah, that so uh, it's and i i think it's not for lack of um attempts at it at it there have been other cad tools uh, since windows there have been one or two cad tools that i've seen that could do any angle and technically altium designer you could you could put a trace at any angle there wasn't a restriction you just had to do that. a lot it's of clicks. it's just that people don't yeah you had to do a lot of clicks to do it right and uh and people wouldn't use that in general. They would almost always interactively route a board using the 90 and 45, you know, orthogonal and 45 degree vert, um, angled traces. And some time ago, I started asking people, why do we, why do we do that? Because it's, it's not for lack of computing power. Maybe in the very early days of CAD, you mm-hmm. know, back when it was, you know, Daisy and and uh, systems like that that used a mini computer or a dedicated workstation. Mm-hmm. The computing power might have been, it might have been easier to do traces right. at 90s and 45s. I don't know, but I asked. I remember asking Charles File about this when he was here, mm-hmm. uh, and saying, "Why? Why don't we?" Because what actually inspired that question when I was talking to Charles was I I have collected a few call me weird, but I'm kind of (laughs) like, I am an engineer and a bit of a nerd, right? So I've collected some Japanese service manuals for some audio gear that I've owned over the years, like guitar effects units and Mm -hmm. things like this. I have a service manual, for example, for a Roland GP8, which is a a very well-known guitar processor from the 80s. And I had one for a while and it needed repairing, so I got a service manual. So... Uh, I have another one for a Nakamichi cassette player, of all things. <laughs> I don't even own a Nak. I've never owned a Nakamichi <laughs> cassette player. Somehow I ended up with a service manual. Maybe I, I may have repaired one for a friend back like right. years ago. But I, right. but I look through this documentation of these Japanese service mm-hmm. manuals in English and they have the most beautiful 
exploded view diagrams and assembly drawings and bills of materials that are extremely thorough and detailed, hundreds and hundreds of components listed. And they show, uh, they show the printed circuit board and where everything's laid out. So, of course, you need that information if you're, if you're repairing something on a bench. Right. And I note that all of these products, even from the mid to late 80s, they, uh -huh. were using, they were using beautiful arced, curved traces everywhere. It oh. was, I'm sure the PCBs were designed uh, with tape and mylar because that's what they looked like. And mm -hmm. they were just super elegant and nice. Uh -huh. And it got me thinking, like, why don't, why don't we design boards like that in CAD? I mean, it, we have the computing power to do uh -huh. it. And Charles, I asked him at lunch one day and he said, because you can't edit it once you've laid it down. And I'm thinking, maybe that's, yeah, that's true. It's if you, if you place a bunch of tracks at oh, different angles I and see. things and you, you need to push and shove something out of the way a little bit, mm -hmm. you basically have to tear it all up and start again. I see. And that's, that's oh, the real crux of it. Huh. So I think where we've lacked computing power until now is, is in the ability to push and shove things in a meaningful way at any angle after having had any angle routing done on the board. Hmm. And that's the key update to Altium Designer 20 that makes it possible. Now we can have uh, beautiful um, flowing traces with tangential arcs, tangential to the trace they come off, and concentric with the object they're clearing. Mm -hmm. uh, that was another funny argument we had in the <laughs> office because <laughs> some of us in marketing were saying, oh, that it's any angle with tangential arcs because you draw a trace and an arc comes off it at a tangent and it's neat and tidy. Right. Uh, and someone in R&D was saying, it's not tangential, it's concentric. But what they were referring to is the clearance from the object that it's going around, oh, maybe I another see. BGA ball. Right. Or a via that's already on the board. So, right. But, but the real key is, yeah, it's easy, to, it's easy to do that routing now with a new trace that you're laying down. Mm -hmm. But the real value is in being able to edit it after it's laid down and being mm -hmm. able to push things and shove them in a meaningful way mm -hmm. without, without messing up the whole design. Mm -hmm. Now, do I understand right that Part of what enables that is really that we've completely rebuilt the routing engine over the last several years. It's not yeah. like just it's, this year. It's a couple of things that it's it takes a lot of time and groundwork to to build the algorithms mm -hmm. needed to be able to do things elegantly. Mm -hmm. And um, and and some people who design hardware who have more a computer engineering background like me. I, I get it because I used to write software right? Uh, and a lot of electrical engineers who use Altium Designer day by day also write software and those those mm -hmm. people who do that would, would have a fairly good understanding how, how much effort is required to manipulate graphic objects. It, yes. it takes a lot of math and testing and time to build libraries to make these things happen. So, mm -hmm. you know, some people say, what, why has it been so long? Right. Two things. One, it just takes time, and and two is we had to hire. We we've enlarged our technical resources. We've right. we've um, made some very strategic hiring uh, in our R and D team in particular, and we've we've actually built a dedicated team for routing since Charles. Uh -huh. Joined Altium uh -huh. a few years ago. Uh -huh. That's that's when it started. We uh -huh. started hiring people who had previous experience in, in auto router development and in topological algorithms. And we've managed to hire some of the right people, which is difficult to do, right? In this yeah, industry, that's it's be very niche. Very niche, right? Yeah, so uh, so we've hired a group and and they're really good and they're they're running full steam now. So yeah. I, I'm excited by what, what 2020 is going to bring in the next decade because we're going to see that leap forward right uh with with some pretty significant power coming right. up yeah um i'm expecting a lot of these guys because they're brilliant they're geniuses 
And uh, so we have that. We've some of the other things since you're on the topic of AD20 and what's new. We've <clears throat> and again, groundwork is the key here. We've also hired a dedicated team just for simulation because this is one area that uh, that Altium designer has had built-in circuit simulation since before I started working at Altium. Mm -hmm. um, we, we even in the 90s had a product called Advanced Sim that was part of the overall unified bundle. Uh -huh. It came with ProTel. Uh, and it, it was a great simulator that was based on Georgia Tech X Spice. And, and we, had, we had some signal integrity capabilities as well in Altium Designer. It's been there the whole time, but. But I have not heard that that is just a really strong simulator. Um, so, well, well, that that's just it. It it hasn't had the love and care. Oh, I see. That maybe so we it hasn't been updated. Or at the same time, we interviewed a lot of customers, and a lot of them said, "Well, we don't, we never even used the simulator. We didn't hardly know it was there." Oh. So either either it's my fault for not mar marketing it enough, <laughs> or people don't need it. But I I think. Um, in more recent customer surveys, we've seen a lot more requests for simulation. Both circuit simulation and signal integrity are really important now mm -hmm. because you're not going to do any, th any new product development and be really innovative and save money and time without a simulator. Right. The only other way to do it is you build it and measure it and see if it works and there's too many variables in modern designs. Right. So. So the other big news was there's no real apparent change to the user interface in circuit simulation in AD20, but there is massive change in that the whole engine was replaced with a much newer variant of XSpice, a, de a derived variant of XSpice uh, is NGSpice, and a lot of the other simulators used separately out in the in the world like uh, ones that you can download for free from certain semiconductor manufacturers, for example, are based on the same engine uh -huh. because it's, it's solid and it's really fast. Uh -huh. And so, so now you have that in Altium Designer still, but it's, you don't have to leave the comfort of the schematic environment that you know. And so you can save time, but it's, the simulation is very fast. But what that does, again, it's an effort, it's a ground, it's a platform effort where we're building the foundation to support something much weightier and more capable. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know for sure yet, and there's nothing I can publicly yeah. promise, of course, but I believe one of the themes, if not the theme, one of the themes of, of the next major release will be, you know, virtual prototyping, simulation, that kind of thing, making sure things work before you go to the cost of building one. Mm -hmm. Very exciting to you know you know that i've been hoping for this for a while since i arrived here two areas you know of course high speed digital and and the rf and microwave market also are two areas and with iot exploding you know all all the new startups or not all of them but many new startups are iot related Yep. And they're going to need that capability. They will. And, and what that means is people who previously, like me, were digital only, let's right. say. You know, my specialty was out of college, out of university. My, my final project was in research was in uh, digital signal processing. So, so I was all about writing C code and Right. And um, and digital electronics and, right. and and I look at all the young people entering the industry now with startups and, right. and developing new products. Mm -hmm. They're doing that stuff, but they're also having to deal with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and low Absolutely. low power. How how far can you communicate between nodes with as little power as possible? So I look at companies like you know. Um, Particle and uh, Espressif and others are coming out with modules and microprocessors that have analog 
bits built in, but right. what it means for you, what it means for me as a board designer is you can't get away with just doing things assuming it's all digital anymore. Even right. if and even right. even if even if it is, it's you're dealing with such high edge rates now and high speed that yep. we we talk to other friends in the field who are experts in RF and they're they're coming around to admit that digital is RF and RF is digital if you if you look at it in the right angle. Yep. <laughs> Which is I'm not smart enough so, to like understand how I, I mean I get how the lines are blurred, but But what this what does this mean for the coming year or two of yeah. anyone in yeah. our industry designing boards? Yeah. What are you going to have to learn? Yes. And I think that's what's interesting to me is, you know, I think to your point that p more people are asking about simulation tools. I think people are being drugged into RF. <laughs> or drugged into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a whole different world. And there are things that you're going to need to learn and know. Yeah. Which is a good segue to talk about a very fun talk that you gave at PCB West this, this year. So, yeah. um, oh my gosh, to our audience, I, you know, no, I have, I don't know, I had about five or six years uh, where I was heavily into RF and microwave boards and I had to learn a lot. It was like drinking from the fire hose and it was not the same as making, you know, digital oh and analog boards. So I had to learn a lot. You followed the white rabbit. I did. That and one that was really a is. deep hole. And I was <laughs> down there and it was dark for a long time. But I luckily had a lot of great mentors that, that taught me. And um, I learned a lot. And I always appreciated this. I think it was Dale Doyle at um, Rogers that said, you know, making RF and microwave bear boards is that they're um they're not always complex but they're difficult right and it yeah. just has to do with geometries and yep. copper roughness and all these variables that that come into play and it might be a two layer board or a four layer board they're not they're not 18 layer 30 layer board so they're yeah. not complex but they're difficult so they I'd say the complexity is not in the manufacturing of the board uh, the, other than other than tolerances, you want very tight tolerances. Right. Because you have to comply with FCC rules and regulations. And you don't want to be one ounce out of the bandwidth that you should be no. radiating at, for example. And then you're putting it but in the a... the complexity is in the design. It's in the design, but yeah. it also... Um, you know, one thing that was crazy to me is that at the time myself as a board manufacturer, I could build a board 100% inside IPC spec, send it to the, the designer and it would be trash because our etching, it may have been within IPC mm -hmm. tolerance for etching, right? but it undercut or it's the trapezoid was too wide at the base or the copper was too rough on the bottom side or the skin effect or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And so we'd have to start over. Yeah. And yeah. So it's really tough. <laughs> I had no idea. So it was kind of going down that rabbit hole. I came to appreciate what a hard job that was because there's so many variables in the design process and so many things you need to think about. Yeah. And um, so I had a great time watching Ben decide that he wanted to go down this rabbit hole from a design standpoint to prepare to give a talk at PCB West. And I would walk by Ben's desk and all of a sudden it looked like he was going to school. There'd be a stack oh, yeah. of these I've been hard bound it. books that yep. looks like. I've been consuming a lot of. Uh, oh my goodness. And it's, there's a lot of good resources out there. There are some of those books are so specialized. They're very pricey and hard to find. One of them, uh, it's, it's a well-known book that um, even Rick Hartley used when mm -hmm. he was diving into this stuff. And I thought, well, 
if one of our industry mentors, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. So I went and found the book, but I could only get it secondhand. And even secondhand, it was something like 160 US dollars to buy a copy. Uh, it was uh, Brian, Brian Waddell's book on transmission line design. It's the transmission line design handbook. Mm -hmm. And it's so packed with any kind of structure you may want to make using mm -hmm. copper on a circuit board and all the math involved in producing it. And even then, every, everything I read, every single chapter maybe references 20 or 30 other academic papers. And some of them I've gone to find you know, an IEEE Explorer and other places like this mm -hmm. that um, it, it sure is a rabbit hole. Once you start reading one thing, it leads to others and leads to others. But eventually at some point you realize there's also a practical side to all of this mm -hmm. and it can be learned without, without tons of heartache. I, and so my goal was to put together a class that shows people you can start, don't get paralyzed. Like for years, right. I was paralyzed about this thinking that's impossible. That's for specialists who have PhDs. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to keep going down the rabbit hole, you'll probably find yourself doing that right. eventually. Right. And there's some really amazing materials now, even on mm -hmm. YouTube. Some, I want to give a shout out to this guy. He's a professor of uh, computational electromagnetics at the University of El Paso, Texas. His name is um, Rumpf, Dr. Rumpf. Mm -hmm. um, he has some pretty fantastic tools that he, he himself developed for his classes where he, he creates these presentations where he allows you to somehow visualize. I know happening. who you're and talking about. Key. And I, he, ta he makes <clears throat> physics visible, right? Yes. It, and he's fascinating. He's, to and watch you, and it. What, what, yes. Now, what his what his lectures made me realize was, hang on a sec. I, I'm visualizing electromagnetics all day, every day. Anyway, it's right. light, right? And uh, it's just that's just a different. That's way up in the right in the spectrum at, right. at super high frequencies, right? But are not SHF. It's so above SHF. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, my point was, don't get paralyzed and not give it a go. This is one of those things you, you've got to do study, yes, but you also need to make a start and build some things and measure them. And that's what my course was about. So, as I said, I watched Ben go down the rabbit hole, <laughs> watch these books. I drug some old bear boards that I had in my drawer out for show and tell, and we would geek out about it every once in a while. But what I loved is I is, you know, as you told me that your motivation was is to kind of distill this down so it wasn't so intimidating. And the, then you entitled the talk, The Absolute, Absolute Beginners, Beginners Guide to RF Design, which I think made the course approachable as well. And to Ben's credit, it was very well received at PCB West. So now you are presenting it where again? Yeah, I get to, I got some really good solid feedback from my attendees at PCB West and I, up front, I was very honest with them. I said, this is the first time and you're all guinea pigs and I really <laughs> need your feedback to improve this. And some of them gave me some pretty candid pointers, which oh, was good. great. Uh, one of the problems was I was terrified of not having enough material for them and I actually had way too much. Uh, and so, the three and a half hour class isn't enough really. And at, 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 I'm going to do the same thing at Design Con in mm -hmm. January in San Jose, California. And this, and again at PC, at uh, IPC Apex Expo in San Diego here mm -hmm. in February. But this time I get to do it with some refinements. So I'm going to skip, skip some of the theory I talked about up front. I will still give a light introduction to some of that. Mm -hmm but cut more to the chase of showing uh, a practical introduction to what are, what are all the shapes you see on those. Every PCB designer who has not yet done an RF board will pick up an RF board at a trade show and go, oh, this just looks like black magic. Yep. Because you see the board, you see all these funny shapes and mm -hmm. pre precise transmission lines and curves and chamfered corners and yep. hairpin 
hairpins. They're kind of cool to look at. I think they're sort of... And you're like, I know that does something. Yes. But I don't know what. And yeah. it just seems like a mystery mm-hmm. how someone would even come up with that. And so I, I will be discussing what all those different shapes are, what to call them, and how to design them. And what are what are the issues with materials that you've got to look oh, out good. for? Surface finishes. Um, what what are the main characteristics you want to look for and okay. spec out when you're mm-hmm. designing a RF or microwave PCB? And we'll talk about some of the tools engineers RF engineers use to design those shapes and how you can quickly and easily create them. Uh, it's not going to be Altium designer centric at DesignCon because it's not allowed to be, and that's. We'll, we'll talk about that in our videos on our website right. later on. But, right. um, but in the meantime, it's for anyone using any, it, it's CAD agnostic, but using any tool who wants to get started with and be able to converse about right. RF and microwave PCBs. Well, I so appreciate that you did this class because it's needed because the explosion of IoT and our tool is moving in a lovely way towards SI and um, giving enabling features for more RF and microwaves. So I really appreciate you doing this. And then, you know, I sort of, when I had left the industry for a while and I came back and I jumped into RF and microwave. And so I realized that RF engineers could be, have a PhD in microwave theory or whatever. They were brilliant people but they didn't know how to design a board, but they were being required to. So mm-hmm. I wrote this. I mean, it was an absolute primer on how to build and design a PCB. I mean, it to me, it felt like ridiculously simplistic, but it got picked up as a blog by Microwave Journal, which yep. I'm like... And those articles are still... They're incredibly still valuable. There and and they're if, goofy. if we could poach your articles and put them on the Altium website, we would, but that's obviously it's not our so copyrighted material. But, but it, are, ended, it ended up being there for three years. And like I said, Primer, and I, I was taking knowledge from brilliant yeah. people, distilling it into plain English, and it, it took. People really appreciated knowing sort of the ABCs. Yep. So I love that you're basically doing that on the design side, but in a, a much more technically rich um, yeah, way. I, and I, again, going back to IoT, you brought up IoT, and I notice all, the, all these people, younger people in the industry, having to, normally they're writing C code for a microcontroller and they happen to design the board that that microcontroller is on. But now they need some wireless connectivity and they're like, ah, ah, where do I start? (laughs) How do I make sure it's only going to receive the frequencies I want? And can I use a PCB filter to do that? Well, yes, you can. And there's ways Mm -hmm. of doing these Mm -hmm. things. So, um, so but but it's scary if you've never done it so i want to i i'm sort of going through the pain myself as, as it were to so you can ho- hand it off yeah lead others yes with less i really stress. understand this because i've been down a similar road just n- not as rich technically where i took brilliant people's information distilled it so it was accessible you know, by designer. So yeah. I love that you're doing this. And so um, for our listeners, Design Con is January 28th through 30th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. Always a great show. If you're anywhere near that, I highly recommend. It covers um, not only board technologies, but also chip level technologies. And they have a really robust, I mean, every top name in the industry is there teaching they have a very robust conference they also have an exhibition area where there will be you know people on the floor um, showing their wares so to speak and so a great learning opportunity there ipc apex will be february 4th through 6th here in beautiful sunny san diego Um, they're only a week apart which is uh, unfortunate and we've kind of had this overlap the last couple of years with these two shows. Yeah, the last um, year they were on it. The they same were time. on the same week, so we won't have that problem. Yep. Um, so IPC Apex also has a very um, a, a large, large uh, 
uh, number of classes that you can take. And so that is February 4th through 6th, San Diego Convention Center. Um, and you can go see Ben Jordan talk about our app. Mm -hmm. um, now, one thing you and I talked about, and I just want to sit back here and learn, you know, at the feet of the almighty Ben Jordan. Oh, that's <laughs> not <her>. please. <laughs> but... <laughs> This was an area that I need some education on, and I thought it'd be interesting to our listeners because I've had Lee Ritchie, like, correct me on this, which is a little embarrassing. But so when we talk about RF and microwave, they are not high speed. They are high frequency, typically. Yep. And then there's high speed digital, but then the high speed the RF people are starting to say, well, now high-speed digital is coming into the RF. And I'm like, well, no. And so talk about frequency and hertz and right. what's high performance and what's high speed, what's high frequency, and what's the difference between all yeah. of these. High, high performance, I want to slay that dragon real quick because, okay. you know, high performance can mean a lot of different things. <laughs> And, yeah. and when a lot of people, a lot of people in our industry or people who think about maybe, maybe they're not directly involved in circuit design, right? But they might be associated with our, uh -huh. with technology and that you say high performance to them, they may think of a fast sports car. Somehow speed always comes into high performance, even though that's not what the phrase actually means. High right. performance means it does its job exceptionally well. Right. And that could just be an indicator light, like an LED right. that's going to last a long time. Or like the top right. of the tower has to have these special light bulbs because they have to, they don't want to have, it costs a lot of money to change the light bulb. Someone right. has to climb up and be all harnessed in with safety ropes and it's crazy. Some Sometimes they use an a helicopter to do it. It's so ridiculous. Crazy. So so you want to put a high performance light bulb in right. that job. Right. So high performance can mean so many different things, but um when when we talk about this this seemingly age old argument between high speed digital and RF yes. and saying they're they're not the same, well it comes it does boil down to frequency in a in a current technology so i just put together a a computer it's kind of a christmas present to myself <laughs> um <laughs> but it's it's using one of the newer amd cores a nice new motherboard and new graphics card and lots of memory and all that well these things are all digital they're all digital electronics but but the signals we're dealing with now, they're very high speed digital, and they need length tuning, impedance control. You know, you've got to limit the number of vias. The boards, the DDR4 memories have blind and buried vias, so you don't have via stubs. And all of this is to enable the signal integrity to be able to push the computing. So this is comes back to that high performance computing right. is what people think of now, mm -hmm. right? To push the envelope. So those signals are going between the CPU and the DDR4 memory module, for example, at incredibly high speeds. So you have the speed of the signal as it traverses the board. Mm -hmm. And by high speed, we mean we are using a high clock rate. So we're sending more bits in less time, okay. more bits of information in sequence traveling along the board in less time. The actual speed of the signal in a PCB, whether I flip a switch to turn a light on and leave it, mm -hmm. or I'm flipping the switch on and off really, really fast to send a clock signal to some device at 3.4 gigahertz, and this is where frequency comes in, and that's like people are thinking of clock speeds when they think of high speed because mm. on a computer motherboard you have a clock speed and it's one of the primary specifications oh how fast is your computer oh well uh, this amd ryzen 7 cpu will overclock to 4.3 gigahertz 
That's insane. <laughs> insane. But 4.3 gigahertz as a sine wave is a microwave frequency. Microwaves are from one-ish gigahertz up to um, a few hundred. Three, um, the classic, the classical definition on the FCC spectrum charts, yes. is we, we say three gigahertz to 300 gigahertz mm -hmm. are, the, are all the microwave bands. Um, and, and so you're telling me my computer motherboard is a microwave board? Well, it's carrying microwave, it's carrying signals that have very high edge rates in the microwave with frequency components because even a digital signal is made up of sine waves added together. The superposition, it's called the superposition theory and all the engineers in the audience know this. They know about Fourier, the Fourier series and uh -huh. Fourier transforms and Fourier analysis of signals. There's, and Rick Hartley speaks about this too. There's, there's all these frequency components that make up a digital signal. Uh -huh. And those are all well into the microwave ranges. Uh -huh. And so, you're not designing the board as a microwave board because the PCB signal traces on a digital board, their job isn't to filter microwave frequencies and limit the bandwidth. And their job is not to be an antenna. Right. You, you, their job is right. to avoid those two things. Right. It's to enable the signal to go between the CPU and the RAM, say. Right. Mm -hmm. At as fast a frequency as a at a fast a rate as mm -hmm. you can, without with minimal signal degradation. But what that means is, you have to understand what PCB physical structures will interfere with and degrade that signal's tr path as it travels down that road, right. and so. It is by from that point of view, it is you are dealing with microwaves and you have to understand a stub is going to have a resonant frequency and is going to kill your signal at that resonant frequency if it's a if it's a shorting stub or an opening stub, or mm -hmm. it will create reflections mm -hmm. at a particular frequency. And mm -hmm. that causes signal integrity issues on a digital board. Well, on a microwave board, you're you're aware of maintaining impedance and signal integrity in the same way. Only now you're actually going to do things deliberately to right. limit the bandwidth of the fr frequency because you only want that narrow band right. of frequencies going through. Right. So you're going to deliberately put a stub in or a series of stubs or a bunch of hairpin segments to create a band pass filter and say, I only want these frequencies to pass because mm -hmm. that's all we're allowed to transmit from right. this class of device and with our license right. that we have for transmission. Interesting. So, uh, and, and, then, and then you're going to deliberately, in some cases on the PCB, in some cases you go out to a cable to an antenna, but um, for Wi-Fi and other, and Bluetooth, and other low power systems, you put the antenna on the PCB because it's it's easy to do it. Uh -huh. It's it's convenient and it saves space and you don't need another connector and cable, which is all lossy anyway. You just put your antenna on the board and then transmit through the air. So um, so the difference, the subtle difference is it's kind of um, it's kind of like when you take an image in Photoshop. And you use that tool that makes it inverted and all the colors go to their opposite color oh, and, you, and you make a negative. Right. Mm -hmm. But the information is still there. It's to me, it's kind of like that. I you, see. With a high speed digital board, you have to be aware of and you're dealing with these microwave frequencies now. But there you're, tr you're trying to avoid signal degradation. And uh, in microwave and RF PCB design, you're aware of the same microwave frequencies, but there you're you're controlling deliberately controlling it, yeah. those mm -hmm. using PCB shapes and structures. And so, 
in both cases, you don't want a veer in the wrong place. Right. You don't want a stub in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and if you're just taking a signal from a chip to an antenna, um, there may be very little that you want to do with that routing on the board. You mm-hmm. might want to just, but in both cases, you're maintaining the correct impedance and right. the impedance calculation is done the same way in the layer stack manager with a field solver yep. or with a, a well-known formula in it and your calculator if you want to do it that way. And materials behave the same in both cases. Yep. Still get loss, still yep. get... You still have to calculate all that in. Yep. Interesting. Well, thank you for solving that <laughs> because that's one thing that I'm like was never clear to me, but that makes sense, that you're trying to actually contain within a certain frequency range or, you know, bandwidth or whatever. So that's great. Thank you. Well, you just mentioned Field Solver, which makes me think about a recent uh, formal partnership that we formed with a company called Symbarian. And we had struck a partner, an informal partnership with them going into Altium Designer 19. But as we moved into 20, we formed a formal partnership and they have field solver technology. Yep. And uh, can you talk about what that is, how that's sort of impacting, um, you know, where we are yes. today in Altium Designer? Because I think I'm excited about this. And today. actually the the CEO and founder of that company, Symbarian, yeah. um, is a is a genius PhD. He is one of those PhD guys, um, spent his life, uh, diving into computational electromagnetics for the purpose of solving signal integrity problems and being able to simulate PCB traces. So, so that what came in 19 with that partnership was there that they baked their static field solver. Mm Mm-hmm into our layer stack manager for Altium Designer 19. So that ge- that finally gave people a very accurate um, tool for, for taking into consideration all the materials in the layer stack up and the way boards are made and generating a very accurate uh, impedance profile for uh-huh. the traces in the board. And that works whether it's a high-speed digital board or an RF board and you're, you're doing microstrip transmission lines over Rogers material on your outer layers, which is a, is a common way of doing it, right? Yeah. So um, it'll calculate those impedances very accurately and allow you to drive design rules for trace width based on that. So a couple of things were missing. So in 20, they added more to it and that's for, uh, so previously it would do microstrip and strip line and offset strip line uh, traces and differential pairs and um, and they added a new capability in 20 and I'm just trying to remember which uh, one it was. Uh, it, it, it was the um, uh, tune for delay, right? Uh, that that also was, was added, yes. Um, so it, offset strip line is... Oh, oh, you're saying the, the surface Offset structure. Offset coupling. Okay. Offset coupling. Offset coupling, okay. Um, so, okay. That's so some, some, additional, some additional capabilities have been added in uh-huh. terms of creating impedance profiles for, for more new structures. Um, but yes, to your point, the tune for delay we added into our design rules, but the actual delay calculation comes from the Symbior or Symbarian's um, static field solver. It can calculate very accurately the picosecond signal uh, edge rates based on the structures in the PCB. I thought it was interesting when we were at Altium Live that um, Rick Hartley, when he was giving his keynote in Frankfurt, said, I'm so happy to see Altium doing tune for delay because that's the right way to do it rather than length tuning. I'm like, wow, that was big praise. Well, that's another kind of interesting eye-opening point about this is that you get to see really what what distance actually means in a modern PCB. I I remember even uh, in the in the early days when I first started working at Altium, I would see customer designs where they'd gone to great lengths. 
<laughs> They've gone Pun to intended. great lengths to <laughs> manually add extra trace lengths to tune things. Yeah. And it was, and they just took up board real estate and made their jobs harder to mm -hmm. finish the board when it was completely unnecessary because they'd have they'd have a microcontroller and a memory, say SDR memory, not even DDR, running at 130 megahertz, and their their length tuning between an FPGA and a, D, a SD RAM chip right next to each other on the board and they're trying to length tune and it's like uh, 130 megahertz clock rate. Do you realize where the clock edge, you want the clock edge to be approximately in the middle of your signal transitions? Uh -huh. do, you, do you realize how much time and therefore length you have on either side of that clock edge? It's, it's several inches. <laughs> <laughs> like this does not need tuning. Right, right. But people were still wanting to do it because they saw it on motherboards they'd bought and right. they were like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll, right. I'll, I've got a – or engineers mm -hmm. who would design the electronics and, and wire up the schematic but wouldn't do the board layout mm -hmm. would specify it because they're like, that seems pretty fast, so I think we should probably length tune but without actually doing the math and saying, well, you know, a, a typical FR4 PCB there was was like, you know, many picoseconds per inch. I think, I don't remember off the top of right. my head. It's something right, like right, 15, right. 16 pico picoseconds right. per inch. And, and y y you're not dealing in picoseconds at right. 100 megahertz. Right. So, so it's been a while, and thanks to people like Rick and Lee, training the industry, we've we've got a much clearer understanding mm -hmm. that when to tune and when not to tune, when right. to make your job harder, when to give yourself some slack and just do it, do right. easy routing. Right, exactly. Well, but, but the tune for delay will tell you, and uh, if if you do if you're doing something at three three or four gigahertz, yeah. yeah. It's meaningful, so right at that point. Yeah. Well, um, I also just learned something. Uh, we were talking to David Habuda up, upstairs, who's part of the product team. That said, we have a now, you know, as as we moved into these sort of um, into this partnership and and putting some of these features in our tool, that we actually have a dedicated development team for a simulation. Yeah. Wowzers. So I mentioned the routing one before. We've got dedicated team for simulation, which is the team, their, f their first job as new hires was to replace the old tired mm -hmm. X-Spice sim engine with the new NG-Spice one. Uh, they've, they've done that. So that paves the way for future capabilities, in the, especially in the user interface mm -hmm. and wave editors and things. We should see some new things coming uh, for there so we've got that we've also got dedicated team uh so i mentioned sim and routing we've got a dedicated team for schematic and the fruits of their labors are starting to show now with ad20 as well with mm -hmm. the new dynamic compilation you don't have to compile your design anymore it automatically does it behind right. the scenes and there's been a number of performance improvements in the schematic editor as a as a result so it's, it's faster and more responsive in many ways. Yeah. So uh, another part of that was moving away from the old Windows GDI, which is the old way of doing graphics in Windows, which is now, you know, it's like 30 years old. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it had been maintained all this time, but there was no acceleration. So, so the new schematic as of 20 is all based on DirectX, which a again gives us capabilities and a platform for the future because DirectX is uh, as people know was developed for gaming and is is uh, one of one of the two main sort of ways of doing hardware acceleration with graphics cards mm -hmm. and GPU power so having it based on DirectX is going to make it a lot more powerful for doing right. big there's some designs you have hundreds of you might have a hundred sheets not hundreds but 
you might have a very large design if you're doing a motherboard or a backplane yeah. or something. And this is the only way to move forward. So. It's very exciting. Uh, there's, um, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but one of our users uh, who's doing some military stuff, so I can't mention their name or the company, 127 schematic sheets. Yeah, so they are up there in the hundreds. Oh, that's, that's a big design. Yeah, and it's really cutting edge military stuff. So, but I was like, how do you even manage that? And um, someone that, that knows this person called me and said, they're breaking all day in the designer. <laughs> I was like, no, she's not. Okay, so, um, so exciting things ahead anyways. Yeah, definitely. For, for simulation and some of these areas. And um, I'm really excited where we where we get to go, not only where we are now, but where we're, we're going in the future. Yep. So, trivia question for our listeners. Let's see if you can get this right. We're going to tell you the answer. But did Ben ran this one by me upstairs, so I know the answer. He was saying, "What is the lowest loss medium?" Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> I guessed air, and I thought I was so smart for knowing that, but I didn't know it. So Very close. It's almost the lowest loss. The lowest loss is vacuum. I feel like I was cheated. <laughs> yeah, it took, I had a flashback of being in my first electrotechnology class in college years ago, and the teacher, the instructor was saying, uh, saying, you know, copper is very lossy. And I'm like, but it's the best conductor besides silver yes, and gold. Right. And they're like, yeah, well, sometimes the best way to send a signal is through the air <laughs> or through a yes, vacuum. And yes. I'm like, it makes me think oh, of, yeah. <laughs> it makes me think of hyperloop pods, right? But the, the real question is, is that why guitar amps should be made with tubes? Oh, there's, there's the <laughs> no, musician so, coming yeah. out with you. Is that why vacuum tubes are better? I no. don't know. Well, um, speaking of music and vacuum tubes, that reminds me. So now I want to kind of move into what I think of is the year in rap. And lucky for our listeners, we're not going to break into song right now and do a rap. But... Um, that would be horrible. That I would be rap. so bad. <laughs> Although, I don't know, Ben. You could, no, you could maybe pull it out. No, I cannot rap. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about, um, as we talk about the year in rap and in relation to the music thing, that um, Altium has launched something new that I'm super excited about and I want to share with our listeners. It's called Altium Stories. And... I am a sucker. I think all people like good stories, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> we have started a new sort of video series that just tells your stories, right? People that are designing boards for something super cool or unique, and they're going out and just shooting this, their engineering story, like how they came up with this idea. And I think you guys will love it. It's really great. So it has its own channel now. So if you go on YouTube and look for Altium stories, and one of the stories in there is about Vox. Yes. Okay, so I'm just going <laughs> to let you talk about Vox for a minute because I know that you love Vox amplifiers. Oh, and yeah. So you can tell me well, but what's really why appealing. Vox amplifiers are so cool. Uh, any guitarist knows and recognizes the Vox sound. Um, it's very, it's very, it's, it's, it, people typically call it chimey. And he actually, Dave in the video, the, the guy who works at Vox, the engineer there mentioned that. Yeah. It's true. It's a very unique sound. They're famous because of the Beatles. Um, I personally have never owned one because the British made Vox amps are a little pr pricey. Yeah. They're imp fully imported and, um, my brother, my older brother had one. So that's what kind of special to me. My mm -hmm. older brother was my hero and he taught me guitar and taught me electronics when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and he had a Vox amp for a long time. So that's my connection with them. But, but um, yeah, they just have a very unique Class A tube amp circuit that's lossy in all the right ways. Right. <laughs> yeah. It actually gives really great guitar tone. Uh, and they made, well, I'm going to share the, the link to this Altium story. Yeah. I'll, I'll share the link in the show notes to the Altium stories page, a uh, YouTube um, channel, as well as the one that is box related yeah. because they made a, what do you call like a, a vintage, like a vintage app where they put all the tubes back in. Right. Most of their amps are still tube amps. Oh, but they, they are. Okay. They design. They are designed with a PCB, and that's uh -huh. and the mechanical fit and everything is important to them. Which is, you know, not to give away the whole video. Yeah. That's what they're talking about in the video. But, um, but they have a mix of modern. They have the tubes, but they also have some DSP for reverb and mm -hmm. a delay and mm -hmm. other audio effects as well. that guitarists use so. So, the, but the, the story, Dave's story resonated with me in particular because, and I had nothing to do with making that video. That was right. a completely different project. But um, it resonated with me because his story is very similar. He, he was a guitarist, grew up around music, and also became an electrical engineer. And when he was young, was looking at making his own amps and things and so a lot of a lot of people get into design and engineering because they've started with something else and they want to learn more about how it works they're right. curious mm -hmm. it's like many people i meet who know rf and radio started out as as teenage radio hands mm -hmm. absolutely and they just got curious about how the heck is it that we can send signals through space? Uh, it's just amazing. It. It's amazing to me. Still. And and so they just learn more and more, and they become fantastic engineers. And yep. it's that burning curiosity mm -hmm. that wants to peel back the, the facade of what what the thing that we do and what, what we use, and peel back the cover. Facade's the wrong word because that implies something's fake. It's not fake. Right. It's it's more skin the melon and eat the right, juice inside right, right, eat, right, eat right. the juicy fruit inside right, yeah and uh it's it's good we all love those stories because we all started out our journey yeah. in some way like that i know that. i love these even even psychologists are, you know stories as, are just human. as young people they're like far out people's behavior is really weird and unpredictable and also super predictable if you know Right. If you know about it. And so they get into psychology. It's it, right. no matter what field you're in, we, this right. is how we learn. Right. We see something and we like, hmm. I got to peel back the layers on that. So these stories are wonderful because we get to see facets of what our customers and fellow peers in I the think industry it's a are doing. real celebration just of the engineering craft. Yeah. Um, and there's and these stories i think there's five or six out now but they're cranking these out like one every couple of weeks i think right now but um the so we've done you know the one on vox we did piano arc which yep, is not really a musical fun. one <laughs> another musical one which is 360 degree piano um that came to Altium Live in San Diego and is played by a Lady Gaga's pianist. He's actually a partner in the company. Then we just one came out, which was it's a it's a um, sensory guided meditation device called Core Wellness. There's one about robotics. So, anyways, it's it's I over time this is going to cover the full gamut of people's interests. So, anyways, highly. You know, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy <laughs> Hanukkah, whatever your holiday is. I think that you'll really enjoy digging into these maybe when you Absolutely. have some time off. So I will share the links below, I promise. Um, another fun <laughs> year in thing is that you mentioned to me is holiday gifts for engineers. Now yes. we're going into fun land. Oh, my gosh. So tell me. Tell our <laughs> listeners about a recent blog that we published. Yeah, yeah. One of our users, Mark Harris, wrote a blog that's actually published on our blog site. And if you haven't subscribed, 
to the blog, you absolutely should because we're getting more and more cool articles oh like my gosh, this from so much. from um, people outside of Altium who are just really passionate about what they do. Yep. Kind of like the stories, but written form yes. maybe. Um, so Mark Harris wrote this cool blog and he, uh, some people will <laughs> notice a, f- a few weeks ago on the lounge forum, he posted a question. Hey, I'm wanting to write an article about gift ideas for nerds and engineers. And it, we all have these. Did it light up? <laughs> Did it light it up? Did up a lot of people? I got in there and offered some suggestions, but a okay. bunch of people replied. And it's kind of interesting because engineers and PCB designers, we do not think about regular. <laughs> you, you ask most people out there, what if I could buy you something for Christmas, you know, what would it be? And they'd think, Not oh, an oscilloscope. They'd think <laughs> a, new, a new jacket or <laughs> ties or, you know, jewelry. Right. right. <laughs> uh, or bring some fantastic meal. And we we are all into those things, of course, because we're humans. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it lit up with oscilloscopes and test equipment. And uh, for me, it's it's technology for guitar. So I I named a couple of items that would be really like digital signal processing tools that I use for guitar, which are awesome. Yeah. Um, but it's, so I'll share it's that fun. in the link it's below fun. too. It's really fun. So we're going to share the holiday yeah. gifts from Mark Harris. There was some really fun. I don't think it was in Mark's blog. I think I probably clicked through something and, you know, it took me off someplace else. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's there's one there, gift I think we could all really use. What? And that's time. <laughs> yeah, time. <laughs> I could just have, have the time to explore more of these things <sighs> and learn and um, do more creative work. I know. That's... We could all use that. Yeah, we could all sure. use that. And so that's why we have holidays, I think. So we get a day off to yeah, enjoy right. family, spend time with family and friends. Right. And, um, tinker. Tinka. Tinka. <laughs> T-I-N-K-A. Tinka. <laughs> um, also, happy holidays to you. Um, all the Altium Live, Altium Live was fabulous if you didn't have a chance to go, both in San Diego and in Frankfurt. And, you know, our special gift to you is that all those sessions are online available now. We'll also share those in the show notes um, because... Uh, those are oh excellent. Oh my gosh, you want to drink excellent. from the fire hose. Yes. Just, you know, when you have some time off, just go down that yep. hole because... There's all sorts of really amazing classes yeah uh derek jackson's one had a standing room only in the room he was teaching how to use the spice simulation in altium designer i don't know if john watson a... had a series on um had his series but you're referring management. to the, yes and this is something that everybody should care about so there, there's a bunch of stuff there's there. a bunch of stuff yep. i just don't know if derek's is up there because I think, I don't know if the university day classes are up there, but if they're not, they'll probably end up on our YouTube. I'll find it anyways. I'll make it At easier for you to find it. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, to our listeners, I just want to say thank you so much for making this a great year for the On Track podcast. We love um, running into you guys everywhere we go. And thank you for your kind comments. Again, we always want to hear from you what you want to learn we we have now passed over 40,000 downloads That's and great. so because you are listening and contributing um we get to keep doing this so thank you so much and um lastly wrapping up Ben I I, I think I hope this is going to be short but it may not be <laughs> we're ending a decade now right we're we're crossing that line we're going wow. into 2020 oh. <laughs> what do you see maybe over the next year or two like looking forward for pcp designers what are some trends you see that that we might be heading towards um as we you know head out of this decade yeah. and into the next one i i think i think routing boards is going to keep getting easier and faster and and there will be more long-awaited automation coming um that that 
the role of the PCB designer will change, but it won't disappear. I think there's go, there's still, there is still pressing need for more people to enter this profession. Absolutely. And, uh, and so what I'm hoping is we get an influx of younger, younger people mm -hmm. and those people will do far more mixed signal and have to broaden their uh, skill base skill set they'll have to broaden oh my gosh they have to be more holistic than any yeah. any um previous generations yeah. of engineers i think they have to do a little software hardware a little <clears> mechanical <throat> yeah you know embedded systems they're gonna have to touch a little bit of everything but i'm yeah. really really inspired by all the teams that i see because they're doing that that's true and i i don't think I don't think PCB design or PCB technology is going into it. It's a huge industry and it has a lot of momentum. Um, it will be disrupted way down the, the future, but not for a long time. There's, yeah. there's still more we can get out of this technology and we're, we're going to keep doing more and more with it. Um, I think boards are going to find themselves into more bizarre places. We're already seeing yes. them yeah. in wearable yeah. technology. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think uh, I think more of that kind of human, let's say, augmented reality, mm -hmm. and the next next phase of augmented reality is augmented human. We're already seeing this with Sarcos. You know, Tom Holbrook, uh, one of our long long time customers, is a fantastic. Uh, PCB engineer for a robotics company. So, you guys, Sarcos. this Sarcos robot looks like. They're, so they're building those exoskeletons. Exoskeletons that look like they're from Alien or from The Matrix or yeah. something, right? Yeah. Where you can pick up extremely heavy objects. Yes. But you're in this. But you still need the finesse of a human yes. right there with it who right. can have that. Mm -hmm. human interaction connection but yes. also tactile feedback and be right there in it mm -hmm. controlling it and uh that that more and more is going to be that those sorts of technologies are going to be more and more necessary for the future and um i think there's going to be a lot more in food production as well interesting more electronics and more more boards designed for electronics in precision agriculture Preci precision agriculture is already a very large field mm -hmm. um but but to feed all of us as the population just keeps growing yep is is a big problem but it's a solvable problem at least yeah. for the next 50 100 years i think yeah. Yeah. and so board technology is going to find a lot more application in that as well well and i'm excited you know as an all team employee to see our move towards the cloud too. I think that's gonna be a game changer for engineers being able to collaborate and go work kind of cross-functionally yeah. with all team 365. And, um, you know, for those that can use cloud, I think it's going to be an enabler. Like, I don't know where we're going quite frankly, but I don't think AI is going to destroy the PCB designer. I don't see no, it. No, no. I don't see it. It's going to give them more jobs to do as they have to design bigger, faster computers for doing AI. <laughs> That's a good and point. And those computers, so, yeah. they're the secret ones. Right? Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that's all the time we have for today, but this has been so fun. Our listeners, to our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation yeah. between Ben Jordan and I. I know we've had a blast. We hope you've enjoyed listening to it. Yes. So um, again, we want to we wanna thank you for making Altium the number one PCB tool by seat count in the world. And we want to thank you for making this the number one podcast on PCB design and please um, give us a shout out. We're always eager to learn about you and about what you want to learn. So um, until next time, we want to wish you happy holidays and happy new years. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Judy. Until next year, remember to always stay on track.